Okay, well, I'm, I think we're good to go. So, um, hopefully, everybody can hear us. Um, welcome, everybody, to this live panel discussion, um, part of the contract management MOOC. Um, I'm really delighted to, to be joined today by um, this group, a very diverse group um, of young people working in commercial and contract management at the moment. And um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to take the time to let them introduce themselves. But you know, one of the things I wanted to, to really bring to bear is the fact that really this panel does represent amazing diversity um, and very much um, the diversity of the incredible community that IACCM mm. represents. Um, and we really do feel that the secret of, of the careers for the future is very much the bringing together of diverse groups to innovate. We know that organizations are doing that sort of thing, bringing communities of people together um, in a much more sort of enriching and inspiring environment. So we very much hope that, that this panel discussion is, is going to be very enriching and inspiring for you all today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Douglas Macbeth, who is supporting me, um, and I'm Sally Hughes, I'm the Chief Operating Officer of ICCM. Um, so I will pass over to Douglas now, um, and we will introduce you to the panel who's going to be speaking to you today. Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, not quite sure if, about Sally's introduction about early career people working in contract management, but uh, uh, delighted to talk to so many other, so many young people and listen to their views. So I'm just here uh, for interest and support to Sally. So I'm looking forward to the discussions. So maybe I can pass over to Ruth now and start the introduction process. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ruth Tomlinson. I'm very excited to be here today. I am a third year law student at the University of Southampton. Um, in terms of my actual career, it's only kind of just getting started. I've done some work experience in several commercial law firms, which I've absolutely loved. Um, and I do have a place to do the legal practice course next year. So I'm hoping that in a couple of years time, I will be um, practicing commercial law for myself. Thank you, Ruth. Um, then we will hand over now. Um, Joe, why don't you go? Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Joe Miller. I'm a commercial specialist and supplier manager for the Ministry of Justice and also a member of the Commercial Class Group. Um, and basically what I'm going to be able to speak to you today is about a view from um, the public sector on what we are trying to do in moving forward in the commercial world. Um, I actually started off wanting to be a commercial lawyer um, and had plans straight forward to head straight into the city and start working, um, but actually decided that wasn't for me. Um, and it didn't seem as fulfilling as I wanted that job to be. Um, and actually the offer um, by the civil service and commercial and contract management in general seemed a lot more interesting and a lot more engaging world to enter into as I moved forward in my career. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. So, Chris. So my name's Chris Prince. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Uh, I, I work for Rolls-Royce doing um, commercial contract management with a number of our airline customers, predominantly through the Middle East. Um, I actually studied economics uh, for a degree uh, and then moved on to doing commercial management, um, commercial grad scheme at Rolls-Royce. Um, I've been in uh, a role for the last year now and working more specifically with our customers in the Middle East. So it's been a real interesting experience to get that supply side view of the world of contract management so far. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. And we, we're hoping as well to be joined by Gonzalo Camacho. Um, Gonzalo is actually a World Cup Argentinian rugby player. Um, he was uh, involved in the, in the recent Rugby um, World Cup. And uh, he is also embarking on the ISCCM training program. Um, so we're hoping he's going to join us. He, I know he's got an awful lot of a wealth of um, material and inspiration to bring to this conversation as well. So fingers crossed he'll be able to join us later on in the discussion. So um, I have been informed that um, unfortunately the YouTube chat doesn't work. So for those of you who are um, listening to this conversation live, 
Um, you are going to be able to post questions, um, any comments, either through FutureLearn or also um, on Twitter um, using the hashtag FLContracts. So um, apologies for the technological um, issue there, but um, hopefully you'll be able to get your comments in. Um, and we will be um, stopping to, to look at those comments over the course of the next half an hour or so. Um, so please do feel free um, to, to post any comments, any questions that you might have for the panel, for Douglas, for myself. Um, we'd be delighted to hear from you. So um, I think it's an interesting discussion to be having, um, particularly at a time when in the news we're hearing, and certainly here in the UK, um, that there's a huge skill shortage. Um, and organizations are sort of falling over themselves to try and find um, the sort of skills that they need. Um, and in addition to that, it's highlighted concerns around careers advice for young people nowadays. Um, now, I don't know about you guys, but certainly when I was studying, uh, when I was at school and when I was studying at university, um, I, I didn't really know what commercial and contract management was. I, I don't remember tugging on my father's um, suit jacket and saying, Daddy, Daddy, I'd like to be a contract and commercial manager when I grow up. Um, but I found myself in the world of commercial and contract management, and, and it's certainly been a, a hugely, so far, um, a, a hugely rewarding career for me. Um, Joe, I'm going to throw that uh, question to you. Did, did you feel that uh, you, it was all you ever wanted to be was a contract manager? Um, absolutely not. <laughs> no. um, my initial dream for most of my life was to be prime minister, as it were. As everyone <laughs> is, obviously. Um, that eventually disappeared as I entered reality um, and decided commercial law was where I wanted to go. Um, I didn't actually study law either, which is interesting. Um, I spent my time specializing in Middle Eastern politics and economics, so quite a world away from um, commercial contract management, but spent some time working with city firms um, and planning on moving into the city straight away to start a training contract. Um, but actually, I heard about the commercial fast stream and more generally about the commercial world and thought about what that could offer to me in terms of a career moving forward that went above and beyond simply practicing the law, um, which seems to be the only thing most people understand about contracts. Um, and it's actually one of the only things I understood for quite some time. When you say contract, you immediately think a solicitor, a group of people discussing very technical terms. Um, which can happen, and it does happen, but it wasn't the only thing that commercial is about, um, by no means all it's about, and I felt I could do something more practical, more engaging, and actually get my teeth into things by working on this side, in the contract management side of um, the commercial world, and really um, actively making a difference, not just seeking um, processes and making transactions happen, but instead watching as the entire process un un unfurls and things start to happen. That's where a lot more of the interesting work starts happening. Um, and for me, it was far and away a much better career choice than going into the city. I think you mentioned um, when we spoke previously, Joe, that you'd actually been encouraged to join the civil service through somebody that you knew who was working in the environment. Um, and you, you also you touched on, on the induction program. Now, I know that um, particularly UK government at the moment are focused very heavily on the importance of commercial and contract management. Um, there, there are a variety of reasons why that has now come about. Um, but do you feel that that, um, that focus and energy there is, is inspiring quite a few people? You're not unique that there are actually lots of people who are really enthusiastic about this new world of commercial. Yeah, um, UK government's putting a lot of resources and a lot of energy in trying to build up their commercial expertise, which has been neglected for a very long time. Um, and given the scale and compl complexities of government contracts and government procurement, um, they really do need specialists. Um, the civil service doesn't just do policy. Um, and that's part of the new agenda of professionalizing the service. And one of the new um, and more interesting sides of the service is now creating different professions within the service where it should be seen as a real career choice to go and be a commercial specialist 
um, not just being a civil servant trained in commercial. Um, so I can spend the rest of my career in the civil service taking up all these different opportunities, learning experiences, cross-government working, different projects to really um, get to grips with some of the bigger problems that are happening, particularly in light of government finance problems um, and the wider spending cut agenda. Um, it's becoming more and more important to do better quality services, better quality products, but with less resources. Um, and so that is one of the huge challenges in my role at the moment, trying to get same or better quality services that we're used to, but in an environment facing 25-40% cuts. Um, so it's a real challenge, but it's not necessarily a scary one for contract managers. It's actually quite an exciting opportunity to really develop the skills that we're using every day and putting them into practice and making a real difference. And when you consider the the amount of money that runs through UK government um, on a weekly, um, monthly, and annual basis. I mean, you, you're in charge of, of large budgets, and, and those who are um, in the commercial directorate are, are responsible for huge amounts of, of funds. Um, yes, yeah, the, the numbers are quite staggering sometimes, um, especially when you join the service from outside. I previously worked in the retail sector for some time. Um, and very small SMEs um, and building them up through um, previous work I did through the university and beyond. Um, the numbers are very scary. That's the only thing I can say on that starting out in the world. You have to get over what that number means. Um, and when it comes down to it, the number isn't the primary importance here. Um, yes, it has to add up, um, but that's not my job. That's the accountant's job. Um, my job is to focus on what do I have and how do I use it best. Um, and that's all we're asked by government. The is, value piece. Is the value. Value for money is actually the prim primary focus of all government skills at the moment, um, as you can expect across the world, really. Um, but part of the process now in training us and having us specialists in the role is to um, refocus the service on what it is that we're really trying to achieve day to day. Um, and for us, that primarily is achieving best value for the taxpayer and having the best quality services we can provide um, for the wider UK population. And so by focusing on us as specialists is important, but also opening up that up to the wider civil service. So commercial specialist training is not available just to me and specialists like myself, but available across government through civil service learning um, and other events because it's not only people like me with these grand job titles about commercial management specialisms. Um, everybody needs to know and understand the importance of value for money and commercial awareness. Yeah. Um, and so that's another driver. It's not just about putting people at the top who can do the work, but making sure the wider sector and um, everyone else within the service and the public sector understand really what is needed of them. And I, I think that's so important. It's absolutely right. And again, brings us back to uh, to this comment about the, the diversity of, of, of you, the panel, the diversity of the attendees on this MOOC. And we have a, a, an eclectic mix from different geographies, different industries, very different paths in life, very different times in their career. Um, and equally, the IACCM community is exactly the same. We draw people from so many different um, backgrounds and for the very reason that they recognize how important commercial capability is, whatever the role they're playing. Um, so Chris, let's throw that question to you. So um, did, you, did you tug on your mum's apron string and say, <laughs> mummy, I want to be a contract manager? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, I mean, my, my primary driver, I mean, as I said, I did, I did economics at university, and my primary driver was always looking, I wanted to be in business, a uh, business of some sort, to see a transaction, to be in a transactional world, to be in a world where deals happened, where um, negotiations happened, where you had to build relationships with other external and internal companies. And so for me, I wanted to be in business of some sort. So when I was coming, looking for roles, for my first roles, I started to look into, okay, what could give me that type of experience? And for me, the commercial account management seemed to tick more of those boxes than any other elements. 
and, and it seems to give you a greater view of all the elements of how a business operates and interacts with other businesses um, uh, compared to a lot, a lot of other elements of the profession. So that, that was the angle I came at it from. It certainly seems to be living up to that so far. And for me, although, so what Joe was saying is that perspective, there's the, sometimes that perspective that contract management is all legalistic. Well, and for me, the experience has almost been the opposite way around in so far as it struck me that effective contract management has been a lot more about, in my experience, the value-add stuff you do above and beyond the contract on managing the relationship, managing the commitments, and uh, managing the transactions and any disputes that arise from it, with the contract acting more as a backstop to that business relationship. Um, and, and I enjoy all that element sort of above and beyond the contract, shall we say, and it's certainly delivering in that respect. So. Not, not originally, yeah. but it seems to be delivering, from a business perspective, yeah. the, the interest and the elements that I wanted to know about. So, I mean, and it's interesting that the perceptions that um, there are around commercial and contract management, and I mean, I often say, you know, you, you ask 10 people in a room what, what contract management means or, or what commercial means, and you'll get 60 different answers. So, um, but... There's there's the perception that it's very legal. Um, there's also the perception that it's just a very administrative role. So, what would you say to people who have that view? I, I, th I think, well, at least from from what I've experienced of it, it seems that actually commercial account management is one of the roles within a business or an organisation that allows you to have the the most scope to to act creatively to. Um, to build relationships, to engage with other areas and other businesses. Um, and actually that is all the, you know, managing and administrating the basic fundamentals of a contract is one element, but the real value add element and the reason that commercial specialists and commercial managers actually exist is in order to interpret the contractual commitments and make them work between the two parties those commitments exist between effectively. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've had a couple of questions, and I think before we um, before we go on with the uh, discussion, we'll just raise one of them. I'm just forgive me for peering at the screen, so I'm just trying to read the question. Um, does every business understand the successful contract management process? And if not, could that be the reason why some businesses fail while others progress in a hostile environment? Or do they all go for a win-win without proper contract negotiation? Um, Douglas, I don't know what your view of, of, of that question is. I mean, I would absolutely concur that those organizations that do understand uh, contract management um, and the, the positive ways of negotiating um, tend to be more successful. But I'd be interested to get your views on that. Uh, I, th I think the question raises a fundamental issue that this is still an emerging field. Uh, Joe has pointed out that the UK government is taking this very, very seriously. And we also know that successful companies take it seriously. And, and clearly, um, Chris is responsible for some pretty big contracts as well. So, But on the uh, sell side, as we talk about it, as well as on the, the contract management and the buy side. So I think there is an issue that uh, understanding isn't wide enough spread. I think the opportunities aren't well enough understood yet. But I think over the last year or so, and this MOOC is demonstrating it, uh, that the interest and opportunity in this field is just huge. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and I think uh, the more we can do through the MOOC, and of course the UK Civil Service has been supporting that as well as IACCM, so yes. uh, I think these messages are coming across very nicely now. Yeah, I think so. And we've had another interesting question, which um, is how easy is it to transition into this field mid-career? I have experience in contract managing research as part of a senior public policy regulation career. Um, can see a lot of transferability and that there's a career structure. Um, so, and that's that's from Claire Herbert. So, thank you, Claire. I mean, we have lots of um, questions around how easy it is, is it, um, and you know, in many many respects, that's why ICCM is here to provide 
that core body of knowledge. Um, but you're absolutely right that the, the world of commercial and contract management, there's, there's a lot of um, learning on the job and there's certainly a lot of transferable skills. So um, uh, I think that whether you're beginning of your career, mid-career, um, it, it really doesn't matter. Um, that there's absolutely um, room to, to move into this world. And actually, um, that probably brings me on to Gonzalo. I'm, I'm thrilled, Gonzalo, that you've been able to join us. I hope you can hear me OK. Um, yes. But the, Claire's question about transitioning um, into um, commercial and contract management mid-career is, is a little akin to you. Obviously, um, you are a rugby player, um, and I think you've just come off the rugby pitch, actually. You've joined. <laughs> <laughs> if, I show you, if I show you my pants, you will see that I have to put a shirt on. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so um, perhaps you can just uh, talk about your experience in um, obviously the world of rugby, but, but actually the importance of um, contract management and commercial management in what you do. Well, it, really, I'm, I'm interested, first of all, because um, in the last four years, uh, I've been managing myself, so contract-wise and image-wise and commercial-wise, I've been managing myself, so I'm, I'm interested in to, to see and, and keep on uh, adding uh, knowledge to my to my. Uh, to my portfolio, really, to to see how I can develop for the for the near future. I'm I'm 31 years now, and uh, the end of my career hopefully is four years away, but it's gonna it's gonna be soon. And I'm I'm just uh, trying to deal with it and trying to get a lot of experience. And that's why, on the way, I did it four years ago, just to get that experience to sit be between one another and, and negotiate. Um, with with someone else uh, and see what it feels, what it what it feels also to to you, you feel that you your value is something and afterwards things come one way or, or the other way or sometimes you have the power of negotiation or sometimes you are the underdog so it's just coming together with all those things and and I think it would be very helpful for me I I I see some standard contracts and other they are a bit more more um, uh, how do you say um, changeable you can change them but yeah it's, it's very interesting all these these things for me and um, what you were saying about getting from the pitch to the business uh, well I probably will have more by hearing from you all of you what, what you're saying than by talking I, I just I just think that um, my support here is um, boy, my support. You have my whole support, and I'm I'm trying to to do what my, everything that I can. But but I think that it will be very interesting for me to to manage my skills, the skills that I have, or that rugby gave me for 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 my future. That that is one of the things, big things for me to to. Canalize through that um, through that contract and commercial management. I think that uh, the skills that I got here in rugby and on my whole career, how I am as a person, um, that helps a lot in, in in what contract management and commercial management means. Yeah, and you talk about um, obviously the skills that you've had to develop on the rugby pitch, such as um, leadership, um, you know, team team player. Um, being being innovative, being inspirational um, to those around you, and those are all things that we talk about and and uh, incorporate part of the ICCM training as well, and particularly things like leadership skills. So, um, do you feel that that those skills that, that are ones that you would bring with you? That those again, in Claire's words, are very transferable skills. Yes, exactly. They are they are very good skills. Uh, leadership is one of them. You also have you also in the pitch. You you have to to be a leader. Not only um, the captain is the one that leads the team. If not, it's everyone. There's sometimes that uh, uh, one guy beside you has the, the deep, and you have to just raise him up and and motivate him. Or as well, uh, sometimes it happens to the team, or or as a coach as well. I've been coaching as well, so that happens as well on your team. You have to know how to motivate, how to trigger those points 
those points that will give them confidence and try to collaborate with with each other the teamwork over here is very important and well uh, if you have the commitment uh, afterwards and the hard work everything will will go on if you can help each other and, and work uh, through the solutions yeah no, I, I think it's fascinating and Ruth coming to you uh, you you're a student you're, you're a law student as well um, Listening to what the other panelists, what Chris, Joe, and Gonzalo have, have been talking about over the last 20 minutes or so, um, how do you feel that the universities, school, um, are preparing for, for the world of work? Um, do, do you feel that you're commercial awareness comes from some of your work experience are you are you gaining that in in your um, undergraduate environment um, definitely it's something that right from first year has kind of been drilled into us this idea that the law doesn't exist in a vacuum um, and when you study the more commercial modules um, contract law law of the European Union um, jurisdiction law things like this the effect that they're going to have um, on businesses and it kind of goes back to the point that Chris was making about how contracts management kind of is all about all the elements of the business not just kind of one or two things um, and that's definitely something um, that university prepares you for um, again it's kind of it's it's very still very theory based it's something that we're aware of but not really something that we understand in practice very well yet that's definitely come more from my work experience and I've been able to see how the process actually works and you know um, it's not just um, really exciting innovative cases that go to the European Court of Justice it's kind of very um, and I don't like to use the word every day because that makes me sound unimportant obviously they're not um, but there are very um, you know, there are things that happen every day and affect all different um, parts of business. Um, and I think that is something that you're only going to get from work experience. Um, but I think that undergrad courses are now compensating more for that. There's definitely this big push on having this awareness of how your degree operates in the commercial world. Um, and it's also something that the careers departments pick up on they often give lectures on how if you want to be successful in getting a training contract or a job then you need to demonstrate that you have this commercial awareness and it's not good enough to just be able to have a very theoretical understanding of your degree in a vacuum you have to know how it relates to other things as well um, so yes I think that that is something that you can learn um, on an undergraduate degree as well as through experience yeah and and listening to to, to what these guys have been talking about and to their experience and to the, to the roles that they're playing. Um, where does that leave you thinking about the world of commercial and contract management in, in your context? It's definitely a lot bigger um, than I first thought it was. Obviously I tend to look at it more from just a legal point of view um, but I'm now beginning to see kind of just how broad it is and you know as Joe was saying there's a big market for specialization and there's so many different niches um, within the commercial contracts world um, that I think is really exciting and um, I'm really looking forward to being able to explore that in my own career. Fantastic. Um, so we, I've got a few more questions coming in. Um, so there's Frustration, um, this is Darren, frustrating. one thing I find frustrating is the lack of training qualifications available in contract management in the UK, particularly with financial challenges described. Um, so is uh, IACCM is all linked to US, uh, US dollars, is it available here in the UK? It absolutely is available here in the UK, yes, you can, um, wherever in the world you are, um, IACCM training is available to you. It's uh, it's online. There are also classroom-based training um, facilities all around the world as well. So, um, and certainly we can work in different currencies beyond um, the US dollar. So, um, please do feel free to get in touch with IACCM, and we'd be delighted to talk to you more about the the training courses that we offer. Um, be be very delighted. So. Um, one of the things that we are going to be talking about um, in 
the context of this MOOC and over the course of the next week um, is the discussion around the focus of technology and how technology is going to impact this field, um, the, the world of commercial and contract management, and how technology might change career opportunities in this field. Um, so I'm very interested to talk to you all, um, you know, talking to you all as, as millennials, as I, 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 I know people hate that terminology, but um, um, I imagine that technology plays a huge part in your personal lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, Joe, perhaps I'll just throw this one out to you again and say, you know, how, how frustrating do you find the lack of technology in the workplace right now? Um, and perhaps with that, you know, how important do you think technology, what, how important a role do you think technology is going to play um, in our field? Um, I think there is a particularly strained relationship with technology, um, particularly, right. particularly when you go from um, personal usage and business usage. There's an expectation that what we can do at home, off the shelf and just buy online, we can do at work. Um, this isn't really realistic, um, particularly with respect to government IT, um, I work in government technology and digital services, um, and I can tell you government IT is nowhere near as up to date as we would like it to be, and the government is very happy to tell you this. <laughs> um, um, IT across the board is um, a particularly complex area, um, and what I found um, in my own sector and um, with private sector colleagues, um, is a lot of the problem is to do with the scale um, and the complexity of the IT that we're trying to use, um, and to use it for what we want it to do. Um, so a lot of part of the part of IT in the workplace, I think, is managing expectations and um, what do we really expect to do at work um, with with this new technology. So one of the um, areas which have been mentioned before is certainly the administrative side of what we do. Um, a lot of that now can be managed through computer systems, through programs, through databases, um, which means more and more of the sort of paperwork and administrative side of what we do can be done in a very short space of time or indeed automatically, mm. um, which leaves us with a lot more time to engage with these slightly more complex areas that we need to deal with too. Um, doesn't surprise me to tell people, actually read the contract, um, which is surprising how many people don't read the contract these days. Um, but sort of key skills like this um, and key work areas which we can really refocus our time on, and those are the areas that you'll find you'll get the most savings from mm -hmm. as well, especially from a, a cost saving perspective. Um, administrative outsourcing or simply restructuring just to um, IT platforms. Um, does remove a lot of unnecessary burden from those of us who are working in this area and not having to worry about which paperwork is where, where do I find it, who's filing this. Yeah. Instead we know where to go, where it is, and if we need to check something, we type it in the screen and it will come up. Yeah. Um, I think so it, there's a huge amount that we can do. Um, I I'm personally don't think it's going to do very much to change the higher level of what we do. Um, because it's very much based on social skills and on sort of manipulation of data and talking to people and understanding needs, which is something a computer can't really do. Yeah. Um, the yeah. only the downside with IT is simply the cost, I find. Um, and although it would be lovely to have the technology, technology is still at a stage where it's cheaper to hire someone to do it than it is to invest in the technology. Um, particularly on such an enormous scale, um, such as UK government, yes, um, with 400,000 civil servants alone, um, just working in central government. Um, it's those costs you have to mitigate, um, and given our um, sort of spending availability and spending reviews and things, we have to prioritise what we're going to spend our money on. Mm. Um, and so, from a, from a UK government perspective, at least. A lot of that is going to be spending on getting the right people in, in the first place, and then worrying about technology. The systems and technology. Um, I think it may be the reverse in the private sector sometimes. Yeah. Um, well, we'll, we'll we perhaps. Um, yeah. In fact, Gonzalo, I was going to ask you. Um, 
in your world, which is very different, really, to 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 the rest of us. Um, do you see technology starting to have an impact on on the world of rugby? Oh yeah, massively. Over here, technology is very important. We we analyze every match that we are playing against, every rival. We are we are analyze them. So we need to to break down the the videos or the matches that they play before how they defense so in that uh, impact uh, that in those things it impacts a lot the technology also a uh, radio uh, when you're inside the pitch uh, they, to communicate with the players the coaches to communicate with them they send messages through radio and they make the the uh, physiotherapist or the doctors that are beside the pitch to go and talk to those players to tell them where are the space to to play or whether they can if they can play more wide game or they have to kick a bit more but uh, technology in this in this type of <laughs> nowadays is very competitive so every little helps uh, and technology is, is massive um, there's one team Saracens in London that they is, they are using a bit of technology that they it goes into their head they put like a chip uh, behind their ear and what it does it, it counts uh, the, the hits that they got in, in into the head so concussion nowadays is a big thing in rock yeah, a lot of papers are sending rock this type of, of injuries obviously a lot they are very very they are using other technology just much the the GP yeah. Gonzalo we're it's all, we're losing sorry. you a little bit um, I'm not sure whether you oh, can hear me. We've sorry. we've lost you a little bit, um, but but I did pick up on the fact that um, you know technology is, is certainly even in in the context of health of the rugby players and 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 concussion, it, it's it's playing a huge part. So, um, Ruth, what about you? You know, you, as a, as I mentioned, you're a student, so you you've had work experience. You you've seen. Um, reality of the workplace how important do you think technology is how how worried are you about the impact of technology on your career um i wouldn't really say i'm worried i think the biggest thing actually that holds back um firms from properly utilizing technology um is the courts um, one thing i've noticed um through my degree is that the courts just don't understand technology they don't really understand how it works um, and it means that there's been case law on things like fax um, but not really on email so for example there's no case on whether or not if you accepted a contract via an email would that count as a as an actual signature um, would it be valid um, and they just haven't really addressed this and I think it's because they don't really think there's a need to um, and especially um, with the internet, it's really not regulated very well. There's been several pieces of quite concerning case law that seem to contradict legislation, actually, in some cases. And I think this arises from just this lack of understanding of how it all works. So I can see how firms are apprehensive to utilize technology when they don't know what the courts are going to turn around and say next about it and how it's going to impact their business and how they use it. Um, and I think it's just going to be one of those things that firms will catch up to when the courts catch up. And I think it's a shame that it's held back that way. Um, I don't think it's a particular problem yet, but um, I mean, at the moment, it's at the most just a little frustrating. Um, but I do hope that in the future, um, we do kind of catch up. And so I think it could be really useful um, to how firms conduct business. I think it's. I think that's a really interesting point, and it is interesting how um, industries and organisations are held back, and and why they're held back. I think you raise a really interesting point. So, Chris, what about your experience yeah. within Rolls Royce of yeah. uh, technology? I, I think firstly, Ruth makes a brilliant point insofar that we have all this fantastic communications technology, and we actually actively manage and communicate contractual issues with our customer or supplier, whoever it may be, um, via email, via phone call, via a variety of new media ways that are just actually not legally recognized. So we still end up signing a load of pieces of paper in a relatively antiquated method, shipping them backwards and forwards across the world to get counterpart signatures. And you sort of look at the technology available today and think, surely there must be a way to have an electronic electronic version of that whole transaction 
you know, that, that needs to catch up with, with the way it's done because we're using technology to manage a contract while actually legally enacting it in technology from 100 years ago. Um, so that, I mean, firstly, that's a great point. In terms of how technology is actually used to manage a contract, I, in my experience, I think there are two key points. One is that in externally managing your contract with your supplier or with your customer, the role of technology is more about a role of communication. You now have more ability to communicate better and more often about how the contract is being managed to resolve any disputes earlier on um, and, and to nip, nip more issues in the bud than you would otherwise. I think the other big element of technology and contract management is, so Rolls-Royce acting as a supplier would, would say, so we've, we've, we've signed up to knit certain things to do for a customer. So all very well, we've signed a piece of paper saying we will do that, put it in a drawer. Now how do we actually then ensure that our business enacts all those commitments and provides those the solutions to the customer? Uh, and uh, sort of as, as Joe was relating to earlier, there's now becoming an increasing role for technology in terms of how do we load those commitments into a information system that will, is then able to automatically inform the wider business um, of all those commitments that, that you've made by signing this piece of paper. So I think those are the internal communication of commitments and the external management of the contract are the two key areas where it's adding yeah. to the profession at the moment. Yeah, well, I think it's going to be very interesting, and it'll be very interesting to uh, to follow on from that conversation with the uh, the discussion that we'll be having next week. Um, so before we wrap up, there's a, a couple more comments here um, from Matthew. Uh, Matthew, personally, I like to maximise profit in business transactions, but I'm not in charge of decision making in my current place of work. With my experience in this course, I strongly believe I can handle any contract, and I hope to get that opportunity soon. Good discussion here. Um, Matthew, I'm really thrilled, and, and absolutely, I'm sure you can manage any contract. Um, um, Colette, Rick, at the company I work at, so many people are attempting to negotiate business deals and contracts without understanding the basic concepts of contract language and management. In my opinion, making the deal is the essential part of the deal, managing the deal that was made over the life of the contract is a lot harder. Um, Gonzalo sound issues, that's <laughs> great. Um, but it's absolutely right, you know, and, and putting, arguably, putting together the contract can be very easy and, and then implementing it can be extremely difficult. Um, so uh, we very much focus at ICCM on the, the holistic view uh, that we need to take with contract management, which is looking at it right from the very inception um, right from the point where you establish who it is that you want to partner with to create that deal with um, through the negotiation process and then absolutely you know the, the area of, of greatest loss for organizations is in that post contract management field um, and that is the area where so much focus uh, there is so much focus now particularly in UK government but in private sector too um, and and really where we can maximize value uh, out of the deals that we do create. So, um, thank you. I'm very conscious uh, of the time. Uh, I think we could just sort of carry on chatting ad infinitum, which would be lovely, but we should probably wrap it up now. Um, Douglas, before we formally thank all of our panelists, I wonder whether or not you have um, anything that you'd like to add. Well, just reflecting on some of the discussions and some of the comments, uh, uh, a number of issues have emerged, kind of transfer of skills. I think we've dealt nicely with that. And that also addresses the issue of, of when you do this. I mean, the, we set up this uh, MOOC, this uh, Hangout for early career people, but there's been a number of points that says people kind of uh, tr can transfer into this, this role inside a company. Uh, and that's what we're trying to support as well, with greater awareness. Uh, of the the kinds of skills they've already got, as Gonzalo was demonstrating, and how you can apply that in a different context. Uh, I think we've also focused on the uh, public sector a little bit, but uh, the, pub, the private sector has good and bad practice as normal. Um, so if you're in an organization who's moving fast in these directions, then good luck to you. 
uh, sometimes it's more of a challenge that you've got to persuade some other people to think about things in a different way. So this course is largely about awareness, but it's also about spreading the word about being involved in the overall processes and, and being more informed that way. So uh, I think the discussions touched on a number of the key issues. So personally, I'm delighted with it. And uh, thank you all. Well, Douglas, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for supporting um, putting this panel discussion together. And um, Gonzalo, thank you so much for joining us. I, 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 was, I wasn't sure whether or not you were going to be able to make it, and we're really thrilled that you were able to join us. So thank you very much indeed for participating. Um, and Ruth, thank you, Chris and Joe. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Um, for any of you who want to continue to ask questions, um, post comments, please don't forget the, um, the Twitter hashtag, which is um, FLContracts. And um, obviously, you can post comments and questions on FutureLearn. We're, we're delighted to continue to um, respond to, to all of them, and we'll address them as quickly as we can. So. Uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll bring the discussion to a conclusion now, but uh, Douglas, thank you. Thank you to all the panellists. It's been really great. Thank you very okay, much. Thanks, Sally. Well done. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.